Hello, I'm doing a book review, and the book I want to review is The 120 Days of Sodom by the Marquis de Sade. Now, I'm doing this review with my friend Bill Burns. Hello, everyone. Now, I do want to warn people, uh, I normally don't give, like, trigger warnings in my videos, but, like, given the subject matter of the book, if you are turned off or, like, really disturbed by rape or pedophilia, we will be discussing some of that when reviewing this book and talking about the Marquis de Sade, so if that is upsetting to you, well, I guess, as they say, viewer discretion is advised. Now, the novel was written in 1785 when de Sade was imprisoned in the Bastille. I'm saying that right, right? That is correct, yes. While being arguably his most famous work, it actually wasn't published in his lifetime. It was published in 1904, which was 90 years after his death. Uh, Bill, you're a little more well-versed in him than I am, so why don't you explain who the Marquis de Sade was? And yes, I know he had a real name, but I just can't pronounce it, uh... And also the circumstances in which the book was written. Sure. So the Marquis de Sade was an aristocrat. He was from an old aristocratic family in, um, uh, you know, in France. Uh, and this was in, he lived obviously in the 18th century. So this was um, prior to the French Revolution, but he actually lived on after the French Revolution into when Napoleon actually was uh, the emperor of um, most of Europe. Um, he was an author. He was he was an author, but he also was a playwright. He actually loved the the theatricality of plays, and if you notice in a lot of his works, they are very theatrical. He loves detail. He loves the the sumptuousness of costumes and 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 um, staging. That is a big part of his works too. Um, so he actually his like many aristocrats at the time, um, he had a good name and a sort of a place in the social hierarchy, but his family is pretty destitute. They didn't have a lot of money. So he ended up marrying a, um, a woman whose family was in the bourgeoisie, in the middle class. They were um, um, they, they were in business. So they had money. So it was like this exchange where uh, the Marquis de Sade got money. And the family got a name. They got attached to a sort of a socially significant name in um, France uh, to allow them to rise up in the social hierarchy. Um, so de Sade, um had a lot of predilections, which we'll talk about, um, you know, hiring prostitutes, um, you know, uh, indulging in his sexual sort of um, um, adventures. And he eventually would get arrested for um, abusing and, uh, and torturing um, a woman. Um, he got arrested a numerous amount of times. Um, his mother-in-law and his father-in-law would usually get him out of trouble with their money. They were able to pay off the women who uh, accused him of these crimes. They were able to pay off judges. They, would be, they were able to pay off so he could get out. And they kept giving him chance after chance after chance. Finally, he ran out of chances. And um, the mother-in-law had, had sort of hated him with a passion and decided he was going to be, you know, stay in jail. He also was being persecuted not only for his sexual crimes, but also for his publications. Um, his first full publication, The Misfortunes of Virtue, which is also known as uh, Justine, was deemed pornographic by uh, the French government. So he had a lot of legal problems going on, and he eventually was um, put into the Bastille. While he was in the Bastille, he continued to write. And one of the works that he was, that he was working on was uh, this, The 120 Days of Sodom. Um, while he was working on it, of course, you had the French, the beginning of the French Revolution. So you had the storming of the Bastille, you have the proletariat, the, the, the peasants storming the Bastille and uh, releasing the prisoners in there. Many of them were seen as political prisoners of the French government, of, of the French monarchy. So that's basically where this came about. So he is released by the sort of the, the forces of the French Revolution, and they trashed the um, Bastille because it was the symbol of the French monarchy, of how totalitarian they were, how unfair they were to poor people. So the Bastille gets trashed, and the side uh, believes that his cell is trashed. All his writings are destroyed. So it wasn't that, that 121 Days of Sodom was destroyed by, like, censors. It just was this mass kind of, like, riot that happened. But what happened was was that his notes were not destroyed. But what happened was because he thought they were destroyed, he never returned to the actual work. So I believe he only really completed the first chapter, and everything after that is all extensive notes. 
So it's an unfinished work, but it was so um, interesting, I guess, to the people who found it because somebody did recover the the manuscript, and later on, as Christian mentioned, it would be published later on to you know very infamously. Um, so that that's where the sort of no, the novel came out of. It's not really finished, but there was extensive notes left. Um, to sort of understand where the story was going. This is also seen in his very last novel that he worked on, um, The Days of Floor Bell, which he worked on when he was in the in the Clarendon, which was an insane asylum that he was put in after the, um, you know, during um, the, the, the revolutionary times in France and during Napoleon's reign. He actually was rearrested for a, a numerous crimes and he was uh, put in the insane asylum. He started working on this novel called The Days of Floor Bell. He dies, and his sons, who are totally scandalized by him, decide to burn everything. So we have very few notes left for the days of Florbell. Now, I also heard that what got him in trouble was his blasphemy as well. Yeah, absolutely, because part of his sexual games, and again, not sorry to become graphic, was um, he would also put he would get um, um, hosts from. Uh, churches, and he would have them placed in his orifices or in, the, or in um, women's orifices while he had sex with them. So yes, he was uh, very anti-religious. He thought that sort of um, you know the clergy were really um, hypocritical. So he would do everything he could to sort of um, fly in the face of that sort of propriety that supposedly the clergy were standing for. And it seems like people are very much of two minds when it comes to Marquis de Sade, like. You know, some people view him as just this, like, reprehensible human being, as basically just a walking piece of human garbage. And then other people view him as almost like a champion of sexual freedoms. And I almost feel the truth is somewhere in the middle, because, honestly, I do not think he was a good guy at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did assault women, and he also was kind of a pedophile, although that does... I guess considering that the age of consent was different back then. If there even was an age of consent. I don't even know if there even was one during, during you know, during those times. Yeah, so there's that to consider as well. But, yeah, I don't think he was a good guy at all. At the same time, it's like uh, I kind of admire the fact that he still wrote this work that was banned during his time. But, he, you know, there is sort of a sense of rebellion about it. Well, his, his first champions really were the Surrealists. I mean, his, his champions always seem to come largely from France. Um, his, so his first uh, uh, real sort of supporters or people who said, well, let's go back and sort of look at this material were the Surrealists, who, of course, loved anything that flew in the face of middle class, hypocrisy, bourgeois, capitalist um, lifestyles. So, of course, they very much, you know, um, uh, embraced him as this sort of rebel figure, as someone who flew in the face of all these conventionalities that they also were critiquing. Um, you had George Battier, who was another uh, um, sort of on the borderlines of the Surrealist movements, who also was very interested in um, in Desaad. He wrote this novel called The Story of an Eye, which is also very influenced by Desaad that, that involves a lot of sort of sexual kind of like transgressions. Uh, after that, it was uh, the existentialists, right? They After World War II, you had the existential movement who were very interested in him, you know, his ideas about freedom and about, you know, the idea of sort of uh, essence versus existence. Obviously, Desaad does not believe in essence. He believes that we're just natural beings. There's no sort of soul. There's no spiritual aspects of it. He's a very much a materialist. And then you had the, um, the, the, the later in the 1970s and 80s, you had the French um, critical theory kind of movement, which you had people like Foucault, uh, Derrida. You had these sort of French thinkers that that really embraced uh, Desaad's writings and tried to sort of make the case that he was a philosopher. I don't know if I actually go that far. I think he was a vicious social critic. I think he had really brilliant insights into his society and sort of how society was structured and aspects of power. I don't know if I'd say he was a, a philosopher, though. I think he's a first-rate satirist. But again, I think that's kind of debatable. Yeah, and there's also, there's the saying, separate the art from the artist. Like, I know you're a fan of Roman Polanski, mm -hmm. at least his films, yes. but you also admit that he's a pig of a man. In his case, I can see you separating him as a person from the art that he commits to film, whereas in Desaad's case, you almost can't really separate the art from the artist because so much of his art was a reflection of him. Yeah, I mean, he really lived his philosophy, and he really believed it, right? He believed that sort of the sole purpose of uh, life was the pursuit of pleasure. That was it. So that even if you committed a crime like murder, like rape, 
um, you know, any violent crime, as long as it was in pursuit of pleasure, then you were being natural because he saw that nature was sort of, you know, nature was cruel. Nature was about the strong imposing themselves on the weak. He was not a believer in romantic views of nature as being, you know, tree hugging and nature was, you know, enveloping everyone. And there was a spirit and an enlightenment, but he did not believe in any of that stuff. He thought that, um, you know, in nature, there's predator and prey. That's it. There was no divine justice. No one was going to help you. You either, you either impose yourself on the weak or you got imposed upon by the strong. Now, what the novel tells the story of four wealthy libertines who, with the help of some guards and a group of aging prostitutes, abduct 18 age boys and 18 age girls and hold them captive in a castle in the Black Forest of Germany. Throughout the course of the story, they proceed to humiliate, rape, and torture the teenagers. So, what are your thoughts on the 120 Days of Sodom? Well, I'm, I think it's a brilliant satire. I mean, anybody who takes this novel seriously and really thinks that this is any realistic depiction, I think is ridiculous. It's a satire. Um, you know, it's halfway between, like, masturbatory fantasy, I guess, for Desaad being trapped in the Bastille, and between, like, this sort of cynical anti-everything comedy. It's like the blackest of black comedy. Um, and what it is is it's really a, a satire on the concept of um, Rousseau's belief that all human beings are innately good and that all human beings are equal and that nature is benevolent, compassionate and peaceful. I think that's real. I mean, that's what I think he's he's satirizing over his all his works. But I think it really comes together in 120 uh, days of Sodom. Right. Because I think one of the things that Rousseau was saying is that the natural state of human beings is freedom. Right. And to protect our freedoms, we enter into these social and uh, into a social contract. Right with other people, with institutions and society, where equality and liberty are to be protected. But what I think the Saab was saying was that the very institutions like um, religion, politics, law, economics, those very institutions that should be safeguarding our freedoms, protecting our freedoms, of course, we're exploiting us. Right, and we're creating this sort of social hierarchy in which produced unequal um, uh, positions in society. And I think that's really what he's looking at, right? I mean, this novel is a novel about power and sort of what power does to not only the uh, victim, what power also does to the uh, perpetrator as well. But I would almost say that more so about the film adaptation rather than the book because, you know, it really does seem like Desaad is on the side of the libertines. He is. Uh, no, ab <laughs> absolutely he is. I, no way would he ever be on the side of a victim, right? A victim is weak and that's it's, – it's, uh, he would almost say that's unnatural, like in nature, if you bet on or, or you support the weak, you're going to end up dead, right? So why would you ever support the weak? The weak are there to be used, abused, exploited by the strong. So absolutely. You know, where I feel like in Salo, Pasolini obviously is on the side of the victims, right? He's not on the side of the perpetrators. I'm kind of of two minds of this book. Like, I'll be honest, there were parts of this book that I thought were absolutely vile and disgusting. Like, namely, like, some of the stories that the prostitutes tell, like, uh, not, not so much, like, the shit-eating stuff, because it's like, okay, you know, that that's, is what it is. But, like, anything involving, like, the pedophilia, like, the, uh, there are a few scenes where, like, the prostitutes talk about how when they were little girls, some of them as young as seven, they were molested by older men. But it describes it in such graphic detail that I honestly felt like I should be going to jail for reading it, you know. Uh, so, yeah, there were parts of this book that were very uncomfortable for me. At the same time, some of it is so over the top that it is clearly satire. And as much as this book probably was Desaad working out certain fantasies, I do agree with you to some degree, he is kind of holding up a mirror for French society with this, because I don't think Marquis de Sade was unique for his time period. I'm willing to bet there were a lot more people, especially people in power, who had the same thoughts and desires as Marquis de Sade. De Sade was just a little more open about it. Exactly. I think that's what he's doing. He's, he, he's venting his anger at a hypocritical society. Right. He's just says, I'm open about what I do. Right. I'm open. I'm open about this. I'm not going to hide behind these things. I'm not going to try to justify them with, um, you know, laws or, or platitudes or, 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 you know, in a, a, a way to in some ways, um, you know, uh, play by the rules of power as established. He's like, I'm not going to play by those rules. I'm not going to be discreet. That's not in nature. Right. Like I'm a natural creature. Natural creatures exploit the weak. 
they are for their pleasure. They own that's all survival and pleasure. Those are the two things that you find in nature. So again, he I think he I would agree with that. I think he feels that French society at that point was totally hypocritical. That the institutions that were set up was was who that were supposedly the we, they were supposed to protect the masses. They were set up to exploit the masses. So he, at least he's being honest about it. I also think it's funny how one of the libertines in the story is actually a bishop, and yet religion is banned among the teenagers. You know, like, they can't practice religion, otherwise they'll be sentenced to death. Meanwhile, you have a bishop as one of the libertines telling them this. And I think it's interesting. I know when Desaad was a child, he was in the care of his uncle, who was an abbot, I believe. Mm -hmm. And apparently his uncle had women go constantly in and out of his place so i think from a very young age desad was kind of exposed to the hypocrisy of organized religion i also think you find that during the times i mean going back to medieval days right in, in pop in popular culture and folk culture about how hypocritical priests nuns are you know of all the sort of sexual things going on right the decameron right it's in the decameron it's in the uh, in chaucer's canterbury tales so again i don't think it was just a personal sort of experience of that i think it was very very much in the popular kind of folk tradition to sort of see how these people who set themselves up as being so high and mighty as being so pure really were the opposite of that it's also funny how the libertines are all people in power these are the same people who make the rules of society yet you see them break every single one of those rules in the story they're above they're above the rules they have power right and again we have one who's an, uh, an aristocrat we have one that's a bishop we have one that's a president, and then we have one that's a banker. So again, I think that what, what Desaad's saying is like, here are the four main institutions in our society that, again, who make these rules, who supposedly obey these rules, who supposedly everybody's equal under the law, everybody's equal under religion, everybody has an uh, equal chance to get economic uh, success, uh, everybody has equal chance to be what they want to be, yet it's ridiculous, right? It's, it's, it's a total facade. And these men show that, that, that what a facade it is, by breaking those rules uh, fl flagrantly, not even sort of hiding it. What did you think of the shit-eating in this book? Which, uh, yeah, if you haven't read this book, there's a good hundred pages of just the prostitutes going on and on about shit-eating. There's a lot of shit eating in this novel. There's so much shit, like the shit is overflowing off the pages. Well, again, I think that's part of his satire, okay? Because one of the things that I think, and this is why I think the novel is, even for all its uh, um, extravagances, you know, on the perverse side, it is a brilliant novel because not only does it satirize the age of enlightenment, right? This sort of focus on reason and logic as the new things that we should sort of be obsessed with or worship. He also satirizes counter enlightenment arguments. And one of the biggest counter enlightenment arguments, of course, were the romantics, right? Goethe, the romantics. And they're the ones who said that um, nature was this spiritual energy. It was this wondrous, mystical, mysterious, empowering, godly like you know uh force so it was almost like the romantics were saying like don't like look past the physical reality of things that that's not important right the outside is not important the, the right it's the in, what's inside right there's this sort of you know inner light that all human beings and all nature has and i think what what Desaad does is he says okay let's go back to the physical let's go back to the body okay you really want to talk about nature let's talk about Shit, urine, vomit, blood, bodily fluids, sweat, spit, smell, stink, right? That's what nature really is about. There is no inner light to these things, right? So I think that's what he's doing. He's saying like, yeah, okay, let, let's, you know, all these people who sort of worship nature and think nature is this sort of wonderful, beautiful thing. Well, let's look at what nature really is. Right, nature is sweat. It's genitals. It's it's dirt. It's grime. It's like all you know. It, and it's something that sort of you know can be deformed and be, can be mangled and mutilated. Do you agree with him? In some ways, um, maybe yeah. I mean, I'm more of a materialist, I guess. But yeah, I mean, but again, I think what he's trying to say is, I, I, maybe it's this idea that we need both accounts. Like, if we only focus on the physical, we, we, lose, we lose some of the understandings of, you know, maybe some spiritual, you know, or, or sort of larger sort of uh, issues. But if we only focus on the spiritual, we lose that physical material reality as well. 
So I think that's what he was doing. He was kind of like going just as the romantics were going in the opposite direction, almost saying that the physical doesn't matter and just look at the inner light and the inner power and spirituality. He was going the opposite direction and saying like, no, what, what, what's, spiritual, what's the spirituality of shit? You know what I mean? And, but that, and, and I think he would also say is that, you know something, between spirituality and defecation, which is the one that we encounter more in life and more frequently in life, Right. And that affects our lives more, you know, and I think that's one of that's why I think there's this sort of this obsession with bodily functions in this novel is to get us back that the body, if nature is physicality, nature is material things for the side, he's like, there is no such thing as inner essence, as spirituality, soul, like forget about that, right? Life is shit. That's basically what I think he's saying. Now, how do you think this compares to some of Desaad's other work? Because this is the only book I've read by him. Well, it's, I think it's much more explicit. I mean, if you read um, uh, Misfortune of Virtue, you know, Justine, Juliet, Philosophy of the Boudoir, um, this is much more um, explicit. You know, and I think he was doing, again, he's doing that on purpose to, to sort of, to, um, but, well, for two reasons. I think one of the reasons he's doing it is to um, highlight the hypocrisies of these of these people in power and their ability to to indulge every kind of uh you know perversion on uh, you know on earth and nothing happened to them by doing that because they're in position of power there's no um consequences to their actions i also think this kind of record of um of perversions and and the intricacies that he describes to me i think that's what he it's a a, a satirization of the age of enlightenment of satirization of reason and science and logic and mathematics, right? And where everything is so exact, everything is categorized, everything is classified, everything is turned into uh, a statistic. You know, and I think that's what he's satirizing too in there, saying like, okay, let's take instrumental reason to its to its logical conclusion that even something like sexuality, which is something that should be personal, that should be private, that should be between two people, becomes something that is, uh, you know, examined, studied, um, you know, uh, in some ways it, it's also, um, you know, shared publicly, same way that sort of science tries to take sort of phenomena and sort of bring it to light, right, and sort of share this with, um, you know, with, with the public. Um, we also see that this idea also in, of course, the 150 Passions, Right, that there's going to be 150 stories told by the storytellers, and again, you see this obsession with numbers and and, and quantity in 120 Days of Sodom, right? And of course, that is right, the Age of Enlightenment, right, where sort of numbers, the quantitative, right, um, statistics, okay, those things become more important than the quality of an experience, right? That quality of the experience is subjective, but qual- but quantitative is objective. I think that's what he's trying to do. He's almost become, he's becoming he. he goes so overboard that you become objective about it. You're not seeing it anymore as sexual perversion. You're just seeing it as a bunch of moves, a, a, a scripted kind of like um, a, a plan or even like, you know, instructions about something. You couldn't kind of totally lose any kind of sentimentality of sex. You lose any kind of emotion, right? It becomes so off-putting, so objectified, it's just a bunch of mechanical moves. And I think that's what he was saying about science, reason, and logic, was that was going to happen if human beings started worshipping reason and logic and, and science and mathematics, that's what people were going to become, right? Just as, as these kind of mechanical people going through the motions and really not feeling anything, just doing it because it was expected of them. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about Desaad's literary influence. Sure. I actually think he has probably more influence in sort of like, like I said, like critical theory, cultural theory, that kind of thing. But there, of course, there was, um, you know, um, literary uh, influence. You see that in, like I mentioned before, Georges Batier. The Story of an Eye, some of the surrealist works that came out of surrealism uh, used, you know, a lot of the, the, the works of Desaad. You also see um, Jean Genet, I don't know of any of his works. Um, he's, uh, he was an author that was very, I think, influenced by Desaad in his focus on the physical. Um, more recently, um, maybe somebody like Brett Easton Ellis in American Psycho maybe sort of getting at some of the sort of, you know, again, I, I believe that that novel itself is also a satire. So also sort of, you know, maybe picking up from some of um, Desaad's works and also uh, the works of Dennis Cooper. I'm very, very read Dennis Cooper. He's another person that I think um, uses a lot of the sort of the physicality of Desaad and the issue of power relationships in his works as well. I also see sort of an influence of Desaad 
on some of the characters in Clive Barker's work, especially Frank from The Hellbound Heart, really does feel like a character right out of 120 Days of Sodom. Yeah, very much so. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, re- you know, you also see, um, I mean, and again, connected with Clive Barker, um, some of the early um, works by um, Coyle, you know, in music, they, they, there's sort of definitely a Sadian sort of part to it. I know, like, uh, the cover of their first album, Scatology, which, of course, I think uh, the Sod would have loved that name, Scatology. Um, is a is actually a, a picture that was taken by uh, Man Ray during the surrealism years of um, uh, of a, a naked behind in an upside down cross that I think is called 120 Days of Sodom. My, my copy of the, of the book it has that picture. And so they use that actually on the cover of the, uh, Coyle's first album, Scatology, actually uses that photo. So, yeah, I think that, um, you know, like I said, like the surrealism movement, but also like the industrial movement of the late 70s, early 80s, the industrial music movement, uh, from which Coyle sort of emerged, and as well his connections, um, Clive Barker's connections with the Stephen Thrower and with Peter Christopherson and John Balance from Coyle, I think there was a lot of sort of a cross-pollination going on. Uh, and speaking of Clive Barker, what do you think would have happened if Marquis de Sade summoned the Cenobites? How do you think the Cenobites would have reacted to him or how he would have reacted to the Cenobites. There's a part of me that almost wants to say he would have called them pussies. But I was going to say, I think the Cenobites would have recruited him, actually. They probably would have been like, okay, you could be the next Cenobite. Um, but no, I, I think your point about Frank and having very Sadian uh, attributes, I think is very astute. Yes, I would agree with that. But yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, I don't know that much about the actual creation of the Cenobites, but who knows? Maybe there was a, a, a Sadian aspect to the creation of the Cenobites, because as you said, I think that Barker very much was, I, who knows if he was a fan or not, but I think he was very aware of the Sad and the Sad's writings and his sort of ideology. And we should also mention that the word sadism actually comes from the Marquis de Sade. Yeah, absolutely. But which is ironic because he was, although he was a sadist, he was also a masochist too. I mean, there are there are many accounts where he uh, had, he was also raped. As well, well, I don't know if he was, you could call it rape because he sort of, you know, was actually, you know, sort of requested it, but he was sexually attacked by uh, men as well. So again, it's one of those things where he, although he was definitely a sadist, there was also a masochistic aspect to his uh, personality as well. So any closing thoughts on this wonderful novel? Um, I, again, I think it's a really interesting satire. You know, I don't know if I think it's his best work. I think probably Misfortunes of Virtue. I think some of his earlier works, because they were less explicit and more satirical and even actually really funny like that you know i don't know how much humor you could get out of 120 days of sodom um but um i think but no i think it's a really really interesting um satirical kind of uh insightful work about power and about sort of how the viewed his the society around him yeah and i'm kind of like as I mentioned before, I'm somewhat out of two minds of the novel. I, I'm really not sure if I enjoyed this or not. It's, like, weird. Like, I kind of... I know it sounds weird that I respect the book, but, I mean, I I do kind of, like... I respect, again, that rebellious spirit of just writing this, like... You know, just writing this at a time when something like this would not have been accepted by society, but... You know, it's it's hard. Like, I can't say it was an entertaining book. Like, uh, my opinions of, of the novel are very mixed, I would say. I could understand that. I mean, it's not an easy novel to get into. It's not an easy... No- you know, most novels, we, we look for some kind of point of view that we... Um, that we identify with or that we can kind of like uh, enter into the novel through a certain character. And yeah, it's a, it's extremely difficult to do that with this novel. I will say this, like, in terms of, like, Marquis de Sade, like... Let's be real, he was kind of a sexual predator, but it, him working those fantasies out in this book, I don't know if this would be a controversial statement or not, but I would rather somebody like him work those kinds of fantasies out on paper than actually, you know, do them. Well, there's a lot of psychologists that would agree with you. I mean, I think there's a big portion of, um, you know, of, of psychology that would say that, that right, that it's much more healthy to work them out in, and I know this might sound weird, a creative ways than to actually sort of, Im, Im, you know, uh, impose yourself on another human being, you know? I mean, there's a lot of societies that that view that as well, right? I think there's like, you know, in Europe, um, you know, there's societies that allow, you know, the free uh, market of pornography and things like that, and they've seen um, levels of sexual assaults and sexual crimes actually drop by the, more, the you know, the, the easier access to pornography. Again, 
there's probably other factors that come into that. I'm not saying that that's the sort of key to sort of ending these things. Um, there's a lot of people who see pornography as being very detrimental, right? It objectifies women. It, um, it, it sort of reinforces the idea that women are there as sexual objects and can be taken. So it's a really difficult topic to... to True, to... but you also have gay porn. No, no, absolutely. I'm getting into side does does it seem to... Um, uh, doesn't seem to limit his uh, his attentions to just women as well. It's funny because Desaad, he, I think it's safe to say he was a misogynist. At the same time, I know a lot of feminists point to Desaad in a lot of cases. Well, they look at, I think they look at people like uh, Juliet in his works, um, like the storytellers. So in a weird way, they were empowered by embracing the perversity in some ways, embracing the objectivity um, they actually succeed, right? And that's the whole point of the misfortunes of virtue, right? Where, um, where Justine, who stays uh, pure and stays sort of virginal and tries to stay chaste, and she is tortured throughout the whole novel. She runs into every horrible situation. And then you have Juliet, who kind of embraces this idea that, yeah, men are going to use me for sex, but I can use them as well. And she thrives, right? And so I think that's one of the things, right? And you had um, Simone de Bouvier, who wrote one of the first important um, um, essays about Desaad, who was a woman, right? She was, uh, you know, involved in the existentialist movement. She wrote the the, the famous essay, uh, you know, do we need to burn Desaad? Should we burn Desaad? Because at the time, they were going to burn, I think, 120 days of Sodom. That so many, so they, that there was this question of whether they should just burn the manuscripts in France. And she wrote this novel, this, she wrote this essay that said, no, we shouldn't do that for any number of reasons. And I think there is a, I think there's actually a book called The, Femin- the Sadian Feminist, I think that is, I forgot, I think Angela Carter, I believe, she wrote a, 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 a book in which she sort of uh, analyzes Desaad and the women in Desaad. And I know Camille Baglia, who is another feminist, is another one who sort of um, is not on the side of people who think they, Desaad should be banned. You know? But then you have somebody like um, Andrea Dworkin who I think is like one of the greatest, if not the greatest feminist writer of all time, she um, hates Desaad. And part of her uh, book, Pornography, talks about how he was like, you know, this pornographer that was a misogynist and he was a, a sexual predator. A lot of things, uh, the, 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 the um, things that you were just talking about and how, you know, there's nothing in his writing that is redeemable. So again, it, it's an it's an interesting uh, debate. Real quick, before me and Bill get to the adaptations, I just want to cut to my friend Jason, who was in my Candyman review, giving his thoughts on Marquis de Sade's 120 Days of Sodom. Marquis de Sade's 120 Days of Sodom. The first thing that immediately comes to mind, I, I remember, like, I, I, I've gone through the book and read it, and then I've also, I've listened to it multiple times on audiobook, right? Like, it's a whole different experience when you have someone sitting there and, and telling you this story, and you just, like, you're, you're, um, you're consuming, right? Like, you're, you're almost, in a sense, becoming, like, a ruthless libertine that's consuming, right? Like, it's just being fed to you. But there, there's something that, that stuck out, and it was around the beginning where there's the note to the reader. And the reader is, it, it, the note is that, like, you're supposed to choose what you like and leave the rest. So anyone that, like, encounters this book, goes through it, has anything bad to say about it, almost in, like, a weird, like, psychoanalytical way they're they're like exposing their their own desire you know like what you know what what grabs our attention what like seizes our fascination you know you 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 pick that out and either you you talk about it or you knock it down but that like it grabbed your fascination so if the option for this book is almost like a choose your own adventure thing (laughs) then then the parts that stuck out can almost in a way de- like des- describe or say something about the reader themselves, you know. E- even if it's to like knock down the book and say it's terrible, They're, it's in a way it's like that. That could be like it's expressing our fears, right? Like it's yeah. expressing fears, which fear is like wrapped up in like different types of things with pleasure. Like what's the the fine line there, right? Like it's it's expressing fears, it's, ex- it's expressing desires, completely excesses because the book is fucking beyond excess, like. <laughs> But, um, you know, like, three things popping out is, like, immediately that, for me, and I I guess, you know, these will also reveal things about me in this book as well, is that uh, they're only allowed to relieve themselves in the chapel, right? Mm -hmm. So, 
then this is the weird like religious part of it too because in a chapel you know a church you go and and you you relieve yourself you confess right it's it's excesses of of love of tears of joy of everything but you're also like that's mirrored in the fact that like like in in piss and shit and everything like all bodily functions right it's all to take place in the chapel um and then there's uh another rule in the book that anything goes in february right so the the fun part about that is like you have february as uh valentine's and like uh celebration of dionysus right so it's like that anything goes that 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 um that dionysian like orgiastic of everything right so i wonder if that's like did he do it on purpose did did he know like the the correlation with february and and maybe dionysus and this 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 orgiastic like um annihilation of self for the entire or the absolute right this losing of self did he know that and then also um the rule that executions occur at the same time and place as orgies right the executions for punishment and executions in themselves imagine people watching executions and getting riled up they're getting riled up there in an orgiastic fever right and it's that orgiastic fever itself is like um a contagion which is in the sense of an orgy like George Bataille talks about it's like it's a contagion that like the 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 eroticism just jumps from one to another to another there's no fucking end right like where are you in where does the other begin it just keeps going um so those are three very interesting points in 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 120 days of Sodom itself and you know really looking at this book and Desaad's writing in this book specifically from a Bataille point of view um like Desaad is showing the limits of the libertine right and the libertine is the sovereign man um where like where 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 does it go how far can you go with like with with libertine it liber libertinage <laughs> libertinism you know how far can the libertine go how far can the sovereign man go and what is he sovereign from sovereign from other people in the in the you know sovereign from necessity so to be completely sovereign um one has to reject others right the like the use like the 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 Saudian man rejects others and their value and they're submitted or like put down to the place of an object for the pleasure of the sovereign man right uh, for them to do whatever they need to to get to uh, whatever next point it is of pleasure but like the interesting part in that is that like I guess it's a paradox that the sovereign man is actually not sovereign because they need the victim or whatever the sense like in the book the victim they need the object to reach their point of pleasure so it's very interesting there it's, it's not it's it's the, the the freedom that they have reveals a non-freedom which is, is very interesting and I think you know even in um, Salo like it's so clearly defined when the one dude says the limits of love is that you need an accomplice right like they're calling what they're doing love but love is a height of passion and uh, a, a fucking it's completely irrational right and that like goes to the point that like like the the, the Sadian sovereign starts at irrational right like it's and it's it's against reason it's against necessity it's completely to 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 get to its end and then beyond that end it starts at irrational but everything like each one of the chapters in this each in each one of the 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 150s be it the the simple the complex the murderous whatever right they're fucking meticulous (laughs) you know so it starts at irrational but but it it ends at like a high level of control like everything is like conditional like it's specific right like like for (laughs) for 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 someone in the book to to have their fuck inundated they need someone to inundate their fuck right like or like the priest like needs the procurus right the 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 priest needs like you you need the accomplice to get you to the point so 
where like that that shows that power is like conferred in this sense by the victim to the one that considers himself sovereign which is like infinitely interesting it it's so strange to like touch this this book and like try to figure out a way to analyze it because like you know my experience with it is just like it's just a an endless list of excesses right and like how do you where do you like where when does excess end like it, it's it's when it's over completely so like we're going to go back to the like Bataille here and, and eroticism which obviously eroticism is a core and, and a thing of this book I mean like it's a very crude eroticism that goes past the point of pleasure and like I think that's really the thing about it because they they do go beyond pleasure like and by going beyond pleasure pleasure as it's known right because they're they're breaking limits constantly and pleasure as it's known or in other words pleasure as we can describe it as in uh not, not not the everyday shit that everyone goes through, right? Maybe shit is very interesting to this book, but <laughs> like to 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 go beyond. So they they reach past that, and then you get to the point of the undescribable or indescribable, and and it's complete new experience. In that sense, it can even be described as a mystic experience. But would you want to touch that? Maybe. Um, but it it goes beyond to the point of crime, right? And like. Bataille describes crime like true crime, like real crime, is crime for crime's sake, not for like, you know, you 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 need money, like in a way to get out of poverty or or to get back at someone or anything. It's purely for its own sake. And once you know, there's there's points where people um, you you reach past the uh, limit in eroticism where you know we can say what's good or bad and you just get to the point of being where you're just doing shit and like that's when things get mixed because that that's when pain and pleasure become like the the line is gone right like in things you know get flipped over uh topsy-turvy they're mixed together and then you like it reveals crime i even think the the, the build of this is interesting too because it's like simple passions complex passions um criminal and then murderous right so it leads like purely towards crime for crime's sake past pleasure and at that point it's like what's the end you know and it and it's interesting because it's like you know to for him to get to this point he needs to be in his position of like isolation and against others but then it, it shows like you you're still reliant right like like light needs dark the sacred needs the profane <laughs> and the sovereign man needs <laughs> needs others to to define the borders of their sovereignty or to point them in the directions of to, to break the limits so like it's fascinating but it's also like well let's let's not fucking admire side but <laughs> absolutely fucking beautiful it's 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 a perfect book <laughs> there is a small part in Bataille's book eroticism or erotism and he he dedicates like the second half of this book nearly completely to the side and he's going through and explaining the sovereign and the Sadian man and of course this time this is where like the side's works are popping back up in France and people are like oh what the fuck is this this is cool and uh the surrealists champion him to like a great extent and then there's like apologists for him or you know even things that like I, I encountered before and seeing people be like oh you know he was a philosopher he was doing this and that and but Ty is like like don't admire him like there, there's nothing to admire there like almost in a way but let's actually not say there's nothing to admire there but admiring him undermines everything that he's doing and Bataille specifically says that, like, admiring Saad's characters or, 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 or creations undermines, like, it, it, it exalts the victims in his stories. And the victims are needed to, for the, like, the sovereigns to act, you know, for the sovereigns to act upon. Now, if you exalt, like, for example, like, um, 
lords get their power from the people, right? Um, power is conveyed, like is, is conferred to the, the sovereign that's above everything else. So it's like, it's like, a, it's like a balancing here, you know, like the, the victim is here, the sovereign is here and power is given up on like an upscale. But when you admire Saad and bring it to this level of like, oh, he's, he's philosophical, he's a genius, he's, he's the proto-surrealist, this, that, right? Like you've, you've exalted the victims beyond. You've, you've given them power, which they already gave away, which falls the sovereign, you know? And it kind of destroys the entire thing and, and com completely and just like, it ruins what he's doing, and in, in a way, it's like you don't even have to like for even the ties even like for for us to even write about or talk about the side is is also kind of doing the same thing at the same time, right? Like, so even this video would be in a way undermining him. <laughs> and um, I don't care if I undermine him. If I, knew, <laughs> if I knew him in real life, I would probably punch him in the face. Absolutely. Oh, like, he, he might like that, you know, because he was he a may, bit of a masochist. He, he may like it. I mean, like, there's a the thing with the paper cat, right? So, like, the the, the dude the dude did like it. Um, but there there's, there's, there's no reason to admire him. I mean, in a way, like, but, like, but Ty does say that he, he points us to and he, and he reveals to us like like limits right and also reveals like the parts that of, of the side that shake us and shake our reality reveals the fragile parts of like our entire reality right like if, if they can be poked at and prodded at and shaken and parts pulled pulled and things you know can crumble then He's pointing to something out there. Like, what do you do with that? I don't fucking know. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's it. And also, Bataille was like picking at the surrealists. You know, like the the you know the, the surrealists claim to to be you know um, purely driven by the unconscious and desire and, and discovering this whole thing and 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 being like the the kings of like eroticism and all this. But then like Andre Breton was like the fucking Pope. And, and, like, if anybody walked out of lines, they would get smacked or excommunicated, right? Um, so, Bataille was also making fun of them. You know, like, don't try to bring the side into your shit. Now I want to talk about the adaptations of 120 Days, and before we get to the most famous one, Sallow, or the 120 Days of Sodom, there was actually a 1930 French film called, how do you say that name again? L'Age d'Or, The Golden Age. Which is, uh, from what I understand, I've never seen it, but apparently it's like a collection of vignettes, and I think the final segment of the movie is loosely based on 120 Days, but you've seen this, right? Yes, very much so. Um, it's, it was directed by Louis Bunel. Uh, it's credited to Salvador Dali and Louis Bunel, kind of like their first film, uh, Un Chan Andalou. But from what I've heard is that, that whereas the first film, Dali had a lot of, of, of input into it, for Lege d'Or, he didn't really have that much input. It's really largely the the, the creation of Bunel. And Bunel was very interested in the sod. He actually said one time that he's a sadist in his mind. Like, he didn't actually do it to other people, but he had that kind of... He, he understood the outlook of what the sod was, was, was trying to get at. And so the last vignette in Lege d'Or is... Um, it, it's this... Uh, you see this woman who's escaping from a castle. And I think it's like one of the victims that the, the, that the four libertines kind of um you know got together and victimized and she escapes and you hear like screaming and stuff and you see one of the i think it's i think it's the aristocrat one of the four libertines comes out and he's dressed like jesus and the woman stops and sees him and she goes over to him like you know to look for to get like blessing or protection or love or compassion or something and he like leads her back into the castle and you hear more screaming and then you see the the the, the libertine come out and he he's got like a fake beard and the beard is off and his and his robes are all covered with blood 
And then that's the end of the movie, which is like shocking, right? This guy put on the the visage of Jesus, right? The the, the very sort of you know the the sort of the, the foundation of Christianity of love and, and and compassion and protection, and he uses that disguise to get her to come back. But um, but no, it's it's really brilliant. I mean, it, it sort of boils down the essence of uh, 120 days of Sodom into like you know 10 minutes. But, I mean, Louis Bunnell, of course, is just absolutely brilliant. One of the greatest filmmakers ever. And you see some Saudian things in his other films, uh, especially in the, the movie um, Belle du Jour with Catherine Deneuve. There's uh, some Saudian aspects uh, in terms of sexuality and power in that film as well. And, and going along also, too, with the idea of... Because the, the main character in that film um, is kind of like a cross between um, uh, uh, Juliet and Justine. Now, this book was adapted into the 1975 Italian film Salo, or The 120 Days of Sodom, by Pier Paolo Pasolini. While I said I had mixed feelings on the book, the movie is actually a lot easier for me to digest than the book is, because at least with the movie, he... Pier Paolo Pasolini was not on the side of the Libertines. The Libertines, while they were ostensibly the heroes of the novel, are very much the villains of the film. And the film is just as disturbing as the book, but again, it's a little easier for me to digest because there's sort of a new context to it. Also, the movie updates the time setting. The movie's actually set... In 1944, during the final days of Mussolini's reign over Italy in the Italian Republic of Salo, what do you think of the movie? Oh, well, honestly, I think it's one of the greatest films ever made. I think this depiction of power and what power does, like I said before, to not only the victims, but it does to the perpetrators, how it makes both become almost dehumanized in some ways, is brilliant. I think it's an absolutely brilliant film. I remember the first time I saw it, I, it was when I was an undergraduate at Hofstra and I took an Italian film course and it was very few people in the course. I think there was like maybe like seven people in the course. So there were like, uh, like, you know, like five undergraduates. And then there was this, these two older Italian ladies who were taking the class because it was Italian film and they like to, you know, I guess they were like, um, they were um, auditing the class. They just wanted to watch Italian films. And the, the film professor was awesome. He was really he had worked on films for Fellini, so like he knew like a lot of you know. And we were going to watch a Pasolini film, and some of this one of these other kids in the class said, "Can we watch Salo?" And the professor, like I had never heard of the movie up until that point. And when the professor heard that, he, he explained to us all about it. And of course, after he explained it to us, you know, and he said, "I don't know if we should show. We can't tell people." But of course, after he told us that, we were like, "We have to see this movie." And I remember it's really funny because I remember after class, like we were going to see it the next class. After class, he, I remember the teacher going over to the two old ladies. I couldn't hear what he was talking about, talking about them. But the next class when we came, the two old ladies did not come to class, and that was the first time I saw it. And we, we you know, we watched it on like on a sixteen millimeter. It wasn't even, I think, even on. Um, uh, VHS. I think he somehow had gotten a 60 millimeter print of this, and we were just like dumbstruck. The kids in the class were just like stunned by this film, about how powerful it was and how in your face it was about th these aspects of power. I mean, it was just amazing. Yeah, it's a movie that I think people really miss the point of because there are people who think the movie is just as vile and disgusting as the book. And whereas I can understand that criticism for the book because to some degree, Desaad was a vile and disgusting person, with the movie, again, Pasolini's not on the side of the libertines. The whole movie is a condemnation of fascism it's a condemnation of the abuse of power absolutely absolutely and i think in the film one of the things i think that he that pasolini does that um that the side does not do is show how sexuality can still be even even in the face of de degradation sexuality can still be a liberating healing force do you remember the scene there's a right that the the libertines have the, the 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 boys and the girls and they tell them right they're not allowed to have sex they're not allowed to interact with each other they're not allowed to have sex because the libertines have to have total control of all aspects of their bodies their minds everything but there's one one of the boys who is actually having sex right secretly with one of the other vic uh, with the female victims. Well, actually, wasn't he like one of the guards? Oh, guards. I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, he was, was the one of the guards. He was a guard, and he was having sex with the maid, the yes. black I'm maid. I'm sorry. That's right. That's that's what it was. And I, that's actually that's interesting to me because the movie does 
while he doesn't have a lot of dialogue, I feel like the movie does humanize him a little right. bit because I remember like when that scene happens and they discover him, he gives the communist symbol of defiance. Exactly, to them. and that's what to me is one of the most important symbols in that in that movie, right? That sort of even though sexuality is being used here to degrade, to control, to humiliate it doesn't it stop his ability to still like enjoy sex to sort of use sex as something that is defiance right they told everybody in the place you, you we control everything you're not supposed to have sex unless we let you know unless we can watch and watching is a big deal in this film too the ability to watch somebody right the, the voyeuristic aspects of it and for him when he right before he's killed when he puts up that that defiance symbol right he was not going to let them control they might control his mind his physical body but they were not going to control his sexuality his use of sexual uh, uh, you know, the uh, use of sex to sort of uh, assert himself. Now, I know Pasolini was a communist, right? He was, yes. Yeah, and uh, I know, like, uh, didn't he make the film because he was, like, afraid that fascism was starting to take a hold again in Italy at the absolutely. time? Yes, absolutely. But I think not just in Italy. I think he was seeing it across Europe as a, as a sort of a response after what, you know, the 60s counterculture, which, of course, was, you know, was in Europe as well as in the United States. And I think he really saw that sort of growing, not just in Italy, but across Europe, that sort of counter counterculture, you know what I mean? Like responding to all the freedoms, all the sort of um, breaking of taboos and all the breaking of, um, you know, like society's sort of uh, oppressive laws and, and, and regulations. And so I think this was his response to that, like what might happen if we went back that other way again. Uh, I think we should also uh, mention that Sala was Pasolini's final film before he was murdered, right? Yeah, unfortunately, yes. Um, I don't think he. I don't think it had, had even come out yet. I think it, w- it had been edited. I know he had a lot of problems, obviously, with the film, with with the editing. Um, so I think I don't even think he was. I don't think he even was alive when it actually came out. Well, didn't he also get death threats because yeah. of the film? Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of conspiracy theories saying that because. Uh, Supposedly, the official story of how he died was that he had picked up a uh, a male prostitute and brought him to um, brought him to this coastal town in Italy. I guess when he was there, he sort of like sort of uh, in and again, seeing as it's a boy prostitute, I don't know why he would be surprised that. Uh, Pasolini was kind of like you know um, was putting the moves on him or whatever and the, the the boy freaked out they had a struggle or whatever this was outside a car the boy got in the car and then tried to get away and by doing it and rather than going straight or back, well, either direction he ended up going in the wrong direction and running over Pasolini and that's how Pasolini died there's been a lot of conspiracy theory that the boy was used as a setup he was used as bait for the neo-fascists to, to kill Pasolini. Because at the time, Pasolini, you know, people look at the film, but he was actually writing a column in, like, a big newspaper in Italy, like a very well-read, a, a widely sort of uh, disseminated newspaper. And he was writing these columns every week, and these columns were always denouncing the neo-fascists. So it was almost like, you know, it's not really Salo that got him killed. It's more so these columns that he was writing that everybody was reading in Italy. Now, Salo, it's one of those movies, it's very much like Requiem for a Dream or Gaspar Noe's Irreversible for me, where it's an amazing film, but it's so depressing that I can only see myself watching it once every couple of years. But... I'm not going to lie, though. There is some dark humor in the film, just like in the book. Yeah, I I agree. I think so, too. Um, And again, that was also something you see in Pasolini's other films, too. Like, I don't think he ever made, like, a totally, you know, sort of uh, a tragedy or a drama without some of that humor. Which I think is also a very Italian kind of approach to sort of, um, you know, tragedy and horror to always find some kind of humor in it. And it's interesting that Salo is kind of like, because I do consider it a horror film, and I almost look at it as like an amalgamation between like what, I guess what you could call art house horror and the subgenre of extreme horror, you know, movies like Hannibal Holocaust or Men Behind the Sun, like it's really is the perfect amalgamation of both of those. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there's a lot of people who though, well, I guess the, what they would say was there's a fine line between critique and exploitation. I mean, there's some people who look at this movie as an exploitation film, right? The nudity, the 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 you know the simulated sexual perversities, the violence, the torture. So I, I've heard all the people who say that sort of people are seeing what they want to see in this film, 
where people, you know, where the critics will be like, this is just an exploitation film. This is basic what it is. Again, I think, you know, again, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Now, how do you feel Sallow compares to some of Pasolini's other films? Because I've only seen Sallow. Well, uh, I think that having said that, we were talking about sort of the humor that's in, uh, there is some humor in Sallo. I think this is the most serious film that he ever made. I think his other films are much more joyous. Like, have you ever seen his uh, Trilogy of Life, I think it's called? Yeah, I know he did, like, an adaptation of the Decameron and an adaptation of Canterbury Tales, which I believe are part of that trilogy. And Arabian Nights. And those ones are really, like, what he called, like, a celebration of life. This idea of sort of, you know, even in the face of, like, the Decameron, in the face of a plague in Canterbury Tales, in the face of, you know, uh, the medieval medieval times of, of the fear and, and the, of the dark ages that there's still life right that even in the face of these horrible situations and these really tough uh environments that one can still celebrate life right there are still things to be happy about there's still things to savor and solo it's very hard to find that here like i said there are instances of black humor but they don't have that sort of like zest for life that you see that in, even in, even in his earlier films where really sort of focused on like um uh, like uh, the, the the ghettos of 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 Rome or Sicily, where it's a really hard life, right? But there's still things there to to enjoy, to sort of savor. You don't really get that in Solo. I actually do really want to see his Jesus film, Gospel According to Matthew, because I, I know he was an atheist, right? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that he made a Jesus film. Well, I've I've seen it and it's actually really good. Um, it, basically, what it is, it's basically he makes Jesus as a social revolutionary. There's there's no miracles. There's no sort of spirituality uh, to it it's mostly that he's like the social revolutionary but it's great it's really and it's really like you know even more so than like less last temptation where it's very earthy you got a feeling that these people really were peasants and people of the earth the dirty faces and the like you know what i mean like it, it's it's very like it's a very earthy film now i know there was a biopic on pasolini uh directed by abel ferrara right yeah i haven't seen it i'm like dying to f I've, I've had the hardest time I remember it was announced years ago. It came out like years ago. I've had like the hardest time trying to find this movie. I, the last I heard it might be on that the this, this streaming service Canopy. So I have to look at that through my library. But I would love to see it because I think it's about his last like month of life or something with flashbacks to other things, uh, other aspects of his life earlier. And so um, it really focuses on that. So sort of when he went to Ostia and I think where he ends up dying. But um, the, the, the stills I've seen with um, Willem Dafoe, he looks, I mean, it's uncanny how much he looks like Pasolini in the stills I've seen. Now, didn't you say you saw a movie that you thought might be sort of a parody on Salo? Yes, it's a film called uh, La Gran Buffet, which means The Great Feast. And Marco Ferreri, I think, is the director. He's an Italian director, but it was filmed in France. And basically, it's about four guys who get together, kind of like the Four Libertines. And what they decide that is that, like, life isn't worth living anymore. They're kind of, like, middle-aged. Like, what's there to live for? And they decide they're going to eat themselves to death. So they're just going to lock themselves up into this, like, villa. And they're just going to keep eating, like, the most decadent, scrumptious, like, indulgent foods. And they start eating, and then they realize, well, this is kind of boring. So then they invite, they want to invite four prostitutes also to come in so they can indulge in sex as well. And what happens is, so they get three prostitutes. But then by mistake, this, like, school teacher gets invited. Like, she just thinks it's, like, a house party or something. So she comes, too. And it's funny because she uh, ends up being, like, the biggest libertine out of all of them. But, again, I think in, in, in it's a very similar kind of structure to what happened in Salo. And it's great. I thought it was, I, I very much enjoyed it. I thought it was really interesting because you have, like, the, the there's even a part with shit in it, but it's supposed, it's funny. They don't eat it or anything. But that's like all like a lot of the aspects that you would see in Salo are in this film, and they're played in a parodic way. Here's my friend Jason again giving his thoughts on Salo. Movie hasn't like Pasolini's uh, film Salo. I remember, you know, when I first watched it, I had not read the Marquis de Sade, right? So like I thought that. Like, that's what the book was. I thought it was a one-to-one, -one, right? And, like, then I remember, like, going in and, like, reading it and, like, flipping through. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, where's, the, <laughs> you know, like, like where where's the place? Where, where's these guys? What's all this, like, what's all these numbers and lists and shit? This isn't the movie, <laughs> you know? Like, I was, I was completely, like, 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 like what the fuck is going on? Um, then also, like, wh why, why would Pasolini be interested in the Marquis de Sade? Yeah, that's an that is an interesting question. You know, like, 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 
completely. Why? Why would he be? You know, I I guess like you know his his he has like a writing called um, um, imper, um heretical empiricism. But like even even at that point, it's like why? Like, do you think maybe is he like one of the people that kind of like maybe like admires Saad? Like, does he? You think Pasolini like looks at Saad at like on the level of a philosopher, you know? Like, I even know one of my old professors, um, he taught a course on Saad, <laughs> you know? And it's like, do I think he's a philosopher? No. <laughs> you know? Like, but, 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 like, like, do, like, because I think, like, saying that, like, Saad's a philosopher, like, that actually just takes away and, and degrades the excesses like that he went to right like it it takes everything from from the level of like complete in to the point of like observation like speculation and shit like that and and i don't know that that's degrading but um as far as it like was uh was solomon in the 70s yeah, 75, 75, 76, somewhere around there. It's insane that I like the movie because I genuinely dislike everything from the 70s until Punk came in. <laughs> really? I, I love the 70s, man. I, it, 70s is like one of my favorite eras of film. It's, uh, so, like, film, that that might be the interesting point. I think, you know, what it is for me with the 70s is, is um, I feel like it's a very brown tone aesthetic for everything, and I don't like it. I kind of like that, though. <laughs> I, I kind of dig that aesthetic. Like, if I ever get my own place, I, I want it to have a 70s <laughs> aesthetic. I understand that. I want the couches to be wrapped in plastic and shit. And <laughs> Maybe that's what I was haunted by, was the plastic couches going up, man. <laughs> you know? Oh, shit. Yeah. I don't know. I, uh, I don't know if I have, like, a lot to say about the movie. Aside, like, I do like it. And I guess that's, like, a, like that reveals me, probably something, you know, mm-hmm. about myself. In the book, um, all of the victims, they're subservient to the, um, the libertines, but the book also says that the victims are on the same level as every other person, right? So, like, they're, they're, they're put in, in the same realm. Um, which, you know... If the limits of love is that you need an accomplice, there's always this, you know, power play over and over again. And if, if, you know, them getting to their points in love, their excesses of pleasure or crime, the fact that they need, they need every one of the, the victims there, right? So, like, who actually has the power? And that could be really actually interesting with Pasolini's in, in telling him, like, oh, well, maybe, like, if the government leads to this, this this point of totalitarian power, you know, or just like an excess of power, like the people, as in the youth in the film, is like, well, the the real power lies with you, right? Like, because you are the ones that confer them their power. So I guess I can see where it can actually like be successful in in that sense. Aside from that, the movie the movie is like aesthetically beautiful, right? Like like. Like just the the scenery, everything done, the rooms, the 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 art, like then that's the the, the subversive part because it's completely fucked up, right? <laughs> like where's where's the where's the line there? <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, I guess with that movie, it's like how like how far can you go? You know, and and lets you see how far can you go, and it also like lets us just test our our limits of things, right? Like we're humans, we want to see like how far we can go with shit. Will this experience fucking with destroy shit. me? Y- yes, with <laughs> shit. <laughs> you know, and uh, w- w- I mean, what's funny, like 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 alchemy, you know, the 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 uh, the prime material is is shit. <laughs> so what, I've seen Holy Mountain. There we go, dude. <laughs> like like. What what if what if like what if the sod is is actually an alchemist <laughs> and he's he's bringing he's bringing shit to, to the level of 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 the novel and Pasolini has now brought shit I just I just see the guy like with the, like shit on his face is <laughs> he's brought to the level of like glorious film and now and now shit is is truly alchemized uh, that that movie's forever changed the word manja for people right? because like. Uh, my dad sometimes says, and I know he hasn't seen Sallow, mm-hmm. but he sometimes says manja when he makes 
dinner and like yeah. it's like god damn it Sal <laughs> <laughs> oh, always like any anyone that says it like immediately like I'm, I'm even thinking now like I just see the dude's face and it's like cross eyes <laughs> manja <laughs> I think that's the whole thing about the movie though like I mean I said before like how fucking visually interesting it is and it's fascinating right like yeah. and we fucking love transgression and also we love like we love to transgress taboos and taboos generally point us to the place of transgression and in our minds that means like like pleasure and discovery is to be found <laughs> so yeah talk a little bit about other adaptations of Desaad's work and also maybe certain like pop culture depictions of Marquis de Sade. Um, well, I know, I, for me, I think one of the director who has probably done the most adaptations, of course, is Jess Franco. Uh, he made uh, numerous films that are based on Justine, Juliet, and Philosophy of the Boudoir. Um, some of his later films, he sort of mixes at elements, so they're not straight adaptations, but he takes different elements from different works by uh, de Sade and kind of, you know, and, and amalgamates them into films. Um, there's quite a number of them. Um, I, my favorite is a movie called Sinfonia Erotica, in which he takes, you know, again, it's not a straight sort of adaptation, but rather takes bits and pieces of other um, Desaad's works and sort of puts them together. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, Franco is a uh, very Desaadian uh, filmmaker. Now, in Jess Franco's adaptation of Justine, I believe there's sort of a framing sequence where Klaus Kinski plays the Marquis de Sade. Which is brilliant, which is, which is I think, absolutely brilliant casting. He only appears, like, in a framing sequence. Like, he's in, like, like de Sade's in jail, and he's, you know, ranting and raving, and he's going to start writing, and then we see what he's writing. So, he's, like I said, he's not really a main character in the film. He's only, like, in the framing devices at the beginning and end. But still, I mean, from everything I understand about Klaus Kinski, or Klaus, Klaus Kinski, however the fuck you say his name, like, he was a real scumbag, and it sounds like he almost, he might as well have been Marquis de Sade reincarnated from what I've heard about him. Yeah, he, he was a real son of a gun. He really was. But I think that would have been brilliant if he would have actually been, like, in a biopic or some extended kind of um, uh, version of a de Sade tale where he was in it. Yeah, I think that would have been. And have Franco direct it or Bunel direct it with, with Kinski, I think that would have been brilliant. There was also a biopic on Marquis de Sade in the late 60s, I believe. I think it was called de Sade, but it was written by Richard Matheson, of all people. I'm also really fond of the movie Quills, which I know wasn't a straight biopic on Marquis de Sade. It was, for the most part, a fictional story, but the Marquis is a character within the movie played brilliantly by Jeffrey Rush. Which I know you said you thought the movie was just okay. Yeah. I actually really liked the movie. Yeah, I guess I, I thought it was just okay. I think I wanted to see more of de Sade's sort of, um, you know, his, his satiric... Uh, um, wit in in the film, which I thought kind of just sort of played out as a as a like a drama, you know. I just wanted to see a little bit more, especially when you see people like Franco and Desaad. I mean, Franco and Bunel, sort of how they incorporated um, Desaadian themes into their works that are really, really intellectually, really challenging. What kind of fascinated me about Quills was actually the Joaquin Phoenix character. I just liked the journey that that character went on, where you see his transformation throughout the course of the film how by the end of the film like he starts off as the head of the asylum but by the end of the film he's an inmate at the asylum and for all intents and purposes is almost it's not literal but he's almost possessed by the spirit of Desaad to some degree like he takes Desaad's place at the end of the movie which I thought was really fascinating yeah that's interesting I could see that now, did Robert Block write a short story? And speaking of the spirit of Desaad, did he do a short story about Desaad's ghost or something? Ah, uh, the skull, the skull of Desaad, right? And same kind of thing that somebody like a collector of like macabre kind of like memorabilia um, finds like somebody sells him the actual skull of Marquis Desaad, and then the same thing like he gets possessed by Desaad, and like all this weird stuff happens. And yeah, it was a short story, I believe. And then I think they, um, I think Amicus made a horror movie out of it with Peter Cushing and. Christopher Lee in it and it's weird like the movie because sometimes you could see like you, you there's like I, Freddie Francis directed it and there's times where like you see like the perspective of the skull 
like through the skull's eyes and you can see like what's going on. So that's kind of innovative, you know. Well, another pop culture uh, reference to the Marquis de Sade was in Grant Morrison's comic book series, The Invisibles. And, you know, The Invisibles, they're like kind of like rebels and revolutionaries and anarchists. So they go back in time and they actually like rescue the Marquis de Sade and bring him to the 20th century so he could sort of, you know, uh, further sort of help them sort of revolt against, have a revolution against like the the oppressive uh, institutions. So uh, that was our review slash discussion on the 120 Days of Sodom by the Marquis de Sade. Thanks, everybody, for listening.